Hey. Actually, I signed up for uh, Tesla's uh, star band or something beta. What is that? It's a sat. Oh, hi, Tim. It's a satellite thing. They're low flying satellites. And they have a beta program. Hello, everybody. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's six o'clock. That's a scheduled start time. We'll give it a minute. I'm Tim Bruno. I'm your uh, WJFF manager and host of this webinar, but only in the sense that I'm managing uh, the back end of things. The actual real host is, well, he's over here on my right side, I guess, uh, under the palm tree. Um, so the way it works, if you've not attended a webinar before, and this is my first time hosting one, uh, please uh, note that, uh, that you can ask questions uh, in the Q&A or on chat. Um, we, you can see us, but we can't see you, attendees. So uh, that's fine. And you'll be able to ask those questions. If you have any problems, just reach out to me directly. Uh, but we will get started in a, in a minute here. Uh, our keynote is first of a Q&A, Paul Chung from the Knight Foundation. And Bain will tell you more about him. And then we'll go to our panelists, uh, a few of whom have gathered here. A few I know are coming a little bit later. Uh, but. Thank you for everyone coming tonight and being part of this. And uh, special thanks to Judith Schwarzstein, who uh, coach chaired the DCOC committee and uh, came up with uh, this idea along with James Lomax and uh, developed it and planned it. So thank you to Judith and thank you to James. And uh, with that, I'll introduce you to the president of our board of trustees, Thane Peterson. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, it's my well, I guess most of you know know me by now, but I'm a described in the program as a retired journalist. I never actually retired, so you could call me an, an underemployed or unemployed journalist. And it's my pleasure uh, to uh, introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Paul Chung. Uh, Paul was born in Hong Kong and grew up in New York City from age eight. He's a graduate of NYU and the Punch Salzberger Executive Leadership Program at Columbia University. He has a very impressive res resume in journalism. He started out in print with the Wall Street Journal and the Miami Herald and moved into the digital re realm when he joined the Associated Press where he helped pioneer data journalism, journalism strategies and di digital training initiatives as head of the interactives and digital news production. He joined NBC News Digital as director of visual journalism and built a team and created an infrastructure to support interactive storytelling. He also facilitated the use of new technology tools to enhance social video creations and immersion, immersive experience. He joined the Knight Foundation where he is now in May, 2018 and he's Director of Journal Journalism and Technology Innovation. In that capacity, he works to ensure a sustainable future for journalism and combat the spread of misinformation and disinformation. And I believe he has his hands full. In addition to all of that, Paul Chung is a diversity activist. From 2013 to 2016, he served two terms as the global president of the Asian American Journalist Association, where he helped raise more than $2 million for training programs for minority journalists. He currently serves on the board of the American Society of News Editors, and he joins us from Miami, where he is based. He will speak to us about consumer and technology trends that have been accelerated by COVID, the COVID pandemic, and what that means for local journalism. A couple of housekeeping notes. 
Um, during Paul's speech, if you have questions, please post them and chat because we're gonna follow his presentation with a, uh, a Q&A. And I wanna give a disclaimer, the opinions of Paul Chung, our panelists, and anybody else who speaks in this event are not necessarily those of WJFF, its board of directors, its staff, and its supporters. We hope for a lively debate. And if all goes well, there'll be something said that some of us don't agree with, and that's a good thing. So without further ado, I please welcome Mr. Paul Chung. And Paul, I turn the, the, the floor over to you. Thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you for having me, and I hope everyone is staying warm. I, I know it's a privilege for, for me to be in Miami where it's warm right now. Um, but today, what I want to talk about is um, how some of the COVID trends in technology and consumer behavior could present itself as an opportunity for local journalism. Um, so I'm going to um, share a screen where I'm going to um, present a, a, um, a deck Let me know if you can see it. Great. Um, so again, um, you know, I'm at the Knight Foundation right now. And just, you know, quick um, summary about what the Knight Foundation is. Um, we invest not just in journalism, but also in arts and the success of cities where the, the um, John James and L. Knight you know, brothers once published. So they published paper in Philadelphia, um, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Miami Herald, the Akron Beacon Journal, um, the, um, the Charlotte newspaper. And so the foundation is really a vision from the Knight brothers. And in terms of what we fund in journalism is we believe in investing in building a sustainable future for independent local journalism. So the community could pursue is true interests. And in, in this vein, we support four program area. Um, the first program area that we fund is First Amendment. So we support efforts to safeguard press freedom and champion free speech. Um, you know, some of the key grants that we fund there is with um, MLRC, where we fund a legal network really for local journalism institution, because we know that um, over the past decade, um, newsroom really lost a lot of resources, especially legal resources, when you have to deal with um, FOIA or libel cases. So this grant is really um, to provide a network of legal expertise where local journalists could tap into and ask questions about, you know, libel and, and FOIA. And so this is some of the key grants in First Amendment. Um, the second thing we invest in is local media. And in here, a lot of people will make the assumption that Knight will fund sort of content creation or um, individual media. What we tend to fund is actually in, in models and methods that advance the practice of journalism. How do we build trust with audience? How do we reach new and diverse audience? And what are the different pathways we could generate revenues? So some of the key grants that we did here is um, a grant um, with the Solutions Journalism Network um, which is very active in the Philly area. And what, they, what that grant allowed to do is for Solution Journalism to partner with 19 different local news institutions in Philly, from television to radio, to broadcast, um, to um, newspaper, to digital nonprofit, to work on a single topic area like prison reentry. Um, you know, and from there, you know, basically all the media outlet cover one subject that offer the topic from a solution lens. So these are some of the grants that we fund in the local media space. Um, the third pillar that we fund is talent and leadership because you know, who's gonna run the newsroom? Who are the next generation of journalists who are gonna make journalism work? And so here we fund not just um, um, you know, special education program, but we also think about um, leadership training, as well as, um, you know, um, leadership um, opportunities for um, emerging leaders. So we fund, you know, of course, the associations like uh, the National Association of Black Journalists, the Asian American Journalists Association. We, we also fund individual leaders who need specialized training so that they could advance, um, you know, their, their newsroom. 
And finally, this is the program area that I fund is in technology innovation. And what does that mean? Um, we basically promote the application of technology that respond to changing ways that people are consuming news, right? So some of the key grants that I worked on is, you know, how do you apply artificial intelligence to make the newsroom operate better or to uncover insights? Um, how do you, you know, how do newsrooms secure better technical infrastructure so that they could start monetizing their newsletter or have a more efficient payment system, right? Because think about some of the um, subscription service that, that, that we subscribe to news, right? Like once you subscribe, you can never unsubscribe because the, the user experience is so terrible. So what we believe in is a seamless user experience and, and you know, using technology and leveraging technology in a way that um, help news. So this is just a little bit about night um, and what we fund, but today I really wanna focus on um, some of the key consumer trends that COVID have really accelerated. So first I wanna talk about um, five trends that we see that we're here to stay. Some of these trends are super obvious. Um, you probably already know it, but it's sort of good to think about how they intersect with local news, right? The first trend is increase in online shopping, right? According to um, Shopify that they see 83% of folks are making at least one online purchase during the first three months of the pandemic. And of course the key demographic people from 18 to 34 report the biggest increase, right? And this is a trend that is not going anywhere right now. So we're gonna see post COVID that people will continue to shop online because you get more choices, um, is easier, and you have a better experience in terms of doing some shop, you know, price comparison. So that's one key trend to really think about, um, you know, um, for a consumer. The second key trend is there's actually a wider support for local and independent business, right? And that is sort of like interesting, right? So when most people are home, they think about, you know, where do you go for your groceries? Like who, you know, where do you get your, your food? Where do you do your takeout, right? Um, what's a local pharmacy? So again, what we see is, is that a lot of shoppers in the US and, and Canada say they are making purchases from local independently owned business since the pandemic. And, and what's interesting about it is a big segment of that are parents of school age. They're the most supportive in terms of seeking out these small businesses in their community. And you can see that in communities like New York, when, when a lot of the restaurants shut down, you know, there's a whole campaign on you know, support, the, um, support Chinatown, right? Because they've been you know, impacted by COVID in different ways, plus you know, the, the racism that's going on against Asian Americans, right? So again, you know, this is a trend that we don't see it going away post COVID. Right, the third trend is convenience, right? Like the demand for curbside pickup. Think about um, everything that you could order from Best Buy to Home Depot, right? Now you could shop it online. And if you really can't wait, you know, you have the option to pick up these products on curbside. And, and this represent, you know, uh, while it doesn't replace the businesses, it represents a lifeline for a lot of small businesses. Um, you know, ranging from grocery store to like vet clinics to, to um, again, um, you know, your local restaurants and pharmacies. Right? And the fourth, um, you know, trend is local delivery. Um, I don't know how many of you have ordered food um, to be delivered to your home because of safety reason. And again, um, this is not, you know, this was once thought of a trend for big cities, but now this is sort of a, a regular trend that you've seen in, in cities and neighborhoods across America. And again, um, we don't see this going away. And finally, the last trend is really the shift toward virtual experiences, right? Just like we're hosting this webinar today, I bet a year and a half ago, you know, WJFF would not think about hosting a webinar. You'd be hosting a in-person event. Well, guess what? We're not alone, right? Everything from your local yoga studios to, to cooking schools to, um, you know, um, to your fitness 
Dick for offering these virtual packages where people are taking advantage of. And again, we don't see that going away. Now, what does that actually mean for local journalism, right? And this is sort of my philosophy is COVID have accelerated many of the consumer habit, you know, from in-person to, to online, but it also brought this hyper awareness to all the different amenities within our neighborhood. And more importantly, trust in the people who are providing these services. So suddenly our world is both big and small at the same time. What does that mean for local journalism? If you are the local institute, you already have a leg in, right? This is not something that, you know, the New York Times or the Washington could necessarily compete with you. You know your audience. And so how do you deliver the information that the audience need in a way that matches these consumer trends. So when you think about it, it actually come up to these numerous opportunity. And this webinar is really, you know, a classic example of how you are reaching out to your audience in a different way, right? Because they know you, they trust you, but now you're delivering, you know, you're, you're reaching out to them in, in a different format because they're home, right? They, they, you sort of, they overcome the hurdle of video already, right? So think about what are some of the digital obstacles that they already overcame because of COVID? And how do you think about serving this community differently? Right? And again, when you think about these five trends, think about the word like local, right? Local and independent businesses. You could, you know, a newspaper, your local media company, are both local and independent, right? The demand for curbside pickup, right? You could swap that in terms of like the demand for some local delivery services. And that doesn't have to be a physical asset. It could also be over a digital asset. And, you know, the shift toward virtual experiences, you know, Zoom webinars, even, you know, group chats um, could be an opportunity. Right? So these are some of the key consumer trends that we want to think about for local media. Now, you know, for this year's C, um, CES, they have many, many different trends, but I really want to highlight three trends that really matter the most for local media, for local journalism. First is 5G, right? Um, you know, if anyone upgraded their phone from AT&T, T-Mobile, this is the thing they're marketing, right? Basically, nearly all the different gadgets that you have in your home, from your Alexa to your phone, needs data to power them. And basically, 5G is promising, you know, that speed and, and consistency for that digital information, and it will make it quicker than ever before. So that's really quick. That, that means that, you know, that, that latency, right? Like, when you think about you know, how many of you are watching your Netflix from your phone, and it's okay with that. Right, and that will only be increasingly better and more efficient. So that's one key trend. The second key trend is focus on home, right? Everything, everything from furniture to computers to, to the thing they're looking for ways to get their tech solution to everyone who's working from home now or anyone who's working in a hybrid mode. For those who's working at home sometimes and maybe in person, right? Like suddenly you have two offices. You have, the, you have your desk at work and then you have your setup at home, right? And, and so think about also the, the kids, right? Like they're, they're learning not just in person in classroom, but they're also learning from home. And think about all these different new gadgets and, and new product that's really catering to that. And so when you fo focus at home, that at, in home experience, you know, aside from these gadgets, you also think about the experience, things like virtual reality, things like augmented reality. I don't know um, how many of you had um, shop at Ikea before, but now before you buy an Ikea couch and sofa, you could basically, uh, I think even Best Buy offer that. You could basically click on the product and with your phone point to where you think you want to put your couch and you get you know, a basic orientation of how the couch looked like in your living room, right? This was brought to you by you know, augmented reality. And again, if you don't have the 5G and you don't have the technology, then people can experience this right now. And finally, 
Um, and this is really important for anyone who's in radio and voice, right? More convenience through voice command. If I basically scream out like Alexa right now, like how, I don't know how many of you have Alexas or, or Google Home, you know, Alexa, play me Britney Spear. Like, I don't know if it just activate a bunch of devices, right? So again, you know, from your phone to these home devices, there's an opportunity, right? You, the voice command is basically the future, right? Even um, when you type a document in Microsoft, you know, in Microsoft Word, there's actually a hack now that you could basically speak to your computer and it will translate your speech into words. So you don't even need to type it, right? Which is great for someone who might have carpal tunnel syndromes, um, or someone who just exhausted from typing all day long because we are in front of our computer the entire day, right? So voice control AI will basically be smarter and more capable and more nuanced. And it also give immediate feedback when data is available, right? Again, think about folks who are in um, broadcast journals and especially the radio folks, you already know how to do voice. You just need to think about what does that look like in these different devices and how do you make it interactive? So why are these trends important for, again, local journalism? As cities and homes are equipped with these smart technology, this will be a golden age for content creators, right? Because local news is no longer confined by the limitation of this thing we call a radio or this thing we call a TV or phone or computer, literally information could be broadcast anywhere from your watch to your refrigerator, to you know, your, your tablets, um, to your computers. So you know, while there's many, many crises in journalism right now, um, you know, the crisis is more about business than it is about content because more than ever, we have many, many different distribution channels on how we express our journalism to our audience. And so that's basically all I have in terms of um, the two sort of eight trends that we should really think about and how we could take advantage of these trends to, to think about that future of journalism. Uh, thing you're mute. Paul, how does this sort of circle back to uh, to uh, actual uh, to radio and TV stations? We're in an area where uh, where we have really a, a diminished uh, number of uh, newspapers and stuff. We've got uh, Lori as our champion, and when you look at uh, and you look at the landscape, we're struggling to whether on air or. Um, by radio or via the computer, we're trying to get, get our message out as best we can. Is this, how is this gonna help us? Are there specific ways you could suggest that this is gonna help a radio station or a newspaper um, to survive in this era? Yeah, I mean, I think first you have to think about um, radio in itself is a distribution turner, right? Is a device, but what is it that you are doing? You are basically provide an audio report for your audience. And there's many different ways you could do that right now. You could actually have a group chat, right? For anyone who uses WhatsApp or any kind of like group messaging, you could type or you could also do audio recording, right? So think about, you know, try to make that pivot away from, I'm a radio person, but think about you're really delivering your, your expertise is your voice. And what are the different technology and apparatus that allow people to hear you? And suddenly you're not just a radio station anymore, right? You could be in everybody's mobile phone in, in a click if they subscribe to you, right? You could send audio messages, right? You could have a podcast. Um, so I think, you know, when you think about reaching to new audiences, you think about, you know, again, where these consumer trends are heading and, and imagine someone say, Alexa, tell me today's news from, you know, um, WJFF. 
All right, Sorry, my, my Alexa just went on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a question from the audience, uh, one of our uh, board members. How do you maintain factual news with so many different content creators having access to, to, to the distribution? Uh, how can you ma maintain factual news? We're in a position where everything is uh, so politicized and polarized. Yeah, I mean, facts are definitely being fraught, but you want to think about um, what makes someone trust you, right? It's not because, you know, I say I'm a journalist, right? It's because that, you know, WJFF and your local media has spent decades building these relationships. And I think these relationships matter. So when you go back to, again, to the trend that I say for shoppers, right? You know, parents are looking to support local and independent businesses in their area. Why? Because, you know, in this pandemic, I want to go to a business and feel safe. I want to make sure that they're observing the health protocol. I want to make sure that when I go pick up my food, I don't get COVID, right? And why? Because I know who's that person behind the counter, right? And so I think trust, you know, tr you cannot separate trust from the relationship building and trust is earned, right? So just because you say, you know, you are a, a journalism organization, that does not give you, um, that does not give you the implicit trust. You have to earn that from the audience. And you could only do so by sort of building that relationship with your community over time. Okay, so local trust is key. Localism is key even in this changing era of uh, technology. Um, I have a question. I'm not quite sure how to ask it. Are you aware of a book called uh, this is how they tell me the world ends. Have you ever read that? Uh, no, I haven't. No, neither have I. Well, anyway, the uh, so I can't <laughs> ask this very intelligently, but the dangers, uh, what are the dangers in this, uh, um, this environment of hacking and, uh, and, and, uh, and having uh, uh, hackers distort your message or, uh, or um, you know, blow up your meetings and that sort of thing? Um, you know, that's a great question. And I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but um, I think, again, is look, you know, some of these digital issues will happen just no different than if you're walking out the street, you lose a wallet, someone could pickpocket you. I would say it's not something that we anticipate to happen frequently but you do have to take precaution. So when you are, so for example, when you're hosting a Zoom webinar, are you doing it in a way over a secure channel? Um, is your website um, observe any of the security protocol, right? So I think, um, you know, there's no different than about, you know, when you go on the street, you just want to make sure that, um, you know, if it's really cold outside, you're not going to, well, maybe some people will walk out with a pair of shorts and t-shirts, but it's not advisable just like digital, digital security have a set of protocol that you should be observing. And, um, and luckily we actually um, fund a lot of different um, organizations that focus on that. So the International Women's Media um, Network, we actually fund them to provide um, digital security training for especially um, women journalists because we see there's a increase of online harassment for women journalists. Um, because it's just much easier. So basically, um, you know, some of the workshop is teaching these journalists, how do you protect yourself? How do you secure your, your email and digital assets? Um, recently, we also made an investment to um, secure drop. So it's basically a, a software that help a lot of investigative journalists um, secure their sources over digital channels. So it's encrypted. And again, um, all of those resources um, if you know if you have questions, I'd be happy to connect you to those experts. Yeah, that's really something that's interesting. If you were uh, doing deep throat right now, how, how would you go about talking? You, you know, as they did during the Watergate era, how would you go about safely talking? We have a good question. This one comes from Galway, Ireland. The point about Alexa is that it allows not just a certain voice activated convenience, but that it enables people to curate their own listening and audio experience. How does radio compete with this self-curated ethic? Well, 
So again, um, think about, so if you put aside radio for a second, um, in terms of your programs, your program is not unthoughtful, right? Someone curated this program for the audience, right? Just like how do you, you know, just like the audience would think about, you don't assume the audience is going to listen to you from, you know, 9 a.m. in the morning to 5 p.m., right? So I think this is where the analytics will help, right? So when you think about doing things online, some of the questions that we're asking is, you know, what are the traffic? How many downloads? Who's listening to you? When they're listening to you? And again, you know, this is something that um, I would say, you know, in a decade or two decades ago. This is not something that people think of, but this is equivalent to sort of um, those ABC report in terms of like how many, you know, what are your ratings? Like how many viewers um, tune into primetime news, right? It's just a different set of metrics that you need to begin to monitor. And you need to ask those hard question is, you know, who, who is listening? What is it they're listening to? And, and based on those data, you know, how does that inform your curation and, and your programming? Well, Paul, uh, Mike Sakel, who, uh, who is one of our local news veterans, when I talked to him on the phone, he was saying, when you're talking to Facebook, basically you're talking to your own analytics. They're talking back to you, telling you what they think you want to hear. And that's, the, the, that's one of the problems with this whole new digital world. Isn't there a problem that uh, that uh, that there's a there's a there's a sort of uh, that that, the, that that the big data companies and the Google and Facebook the companies that dominate our media uh, these days that they're actually coming back at us with based on their 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 analysis of our, our own uh, our own likes and dislikes. Yeah, I think that's if you completely depend your entire analytic base on Facebook and um, Google, right? So, you know, again, you know, this is an area where local um, news organization needs to do better and it is challenging. So when you think about um, the big organization like New York Times and Washington Post and CNN, they are able to capture their own data in a way that they could generate insight, right? So basically, you know, what they do on Facebook's platform or on um, YouTube is just one set of data that's part of the overall analytic. So I think my question back is, you know, if you are local news publishers or a local news general manager, what are the, what are the ways that you could capture your audience data in a way that's primary that you could own and is not reliant on, on these social media platform, but you cannot discount those data, right? Like, so when you think about the audience relationship, your audience is no longer someone just listening to you from this radio device or in the car. They might be accessing through you from a variety of places. And you have to think about in each of these distribution channels, how are you capturing the data and what does the data tell you? Okay, we have a question from a uh, veteran journalist and newspaper owner. I disagree with your statement that content isn't a problem for the news. Or what, what I guess what he's saying is what content, what journal, journal, journalism is producing content that too often reflects an incomplete reality, marginalized, marginalizes the experience and perspective of many communities and favors sensational problem-focused stories over contextualized coverage. Can the news fix its business model without addressing those gaps which drive the failure of press? Yeah, so what I would say about this, um, maybe um, an adjustment, when I say content isn't a problem, what I mean by that is from the consumer point of view, it's not that they don't have enough content. In fact, they have too much content. And the role of local journalism is actually helping contextualize these content for them. And really the question, and, and I completely agree with you, um, Keith, is you need to solve problems for your community. And so the future of local journalism is really about, could you solve these problems for your community? So when I say content isn't a problem, what I really mean is, it's not that there's a deficiency of content, but you probably need, you know, again, 
um, ju professional journalists and intermediary to make sense of the content for the audience. Because right now, you know, I don't have to turn in, turn on any news sources and content would just come find me, right? But they might be unfiltered, they might be out of context, right? So basically our role is not just producing original content, but it's also contextualizing these content for our audience. Hey, Paul, could you just uh, explain very briefly what solutions-based journalism is? You mentioned that you have a big project, I think you said in Philadelphia. Um, um, yeah, so basically solution um, journalism is looking at journalism from a solution lens, right? So too often we see, um, you know, um, a lot of news organizations just highlight a problem, but without really offering what the solutions are. What are the different pathways for you as a community to be able to solve it, right? What are some of the solution that's in the works um, to solve this problem? And what is it that you could take action, right? And so when I was you know, doing um, some training a while back ago, when I was sort of interviewing users in the street, especially the, the younger users, I asked them, do you read the news? They say, no, I say, why not? And, and, you know, I remember vividly this person telling me, well, I couldn't do anything about it. And that really resonated with me, right? Like think about, you know, for all the news that we say we'll do that changes policies that hold politician accountable, somehow the audience that we are informing feel helpless that they couldn't do anything with the information that we give them. So I think we have to be more intentional. What is the, the call for action here? Right? Is it for you to um, discuss this with your neighbor? Um, is this um, asking you to attend your local school board meeting because it's important for you to find out how they're spending your money? Um, is it for you to um, you know, write a letter to your local congressman? Right? So I think, you know, I think for a part of the, the audience that we're reaching, telling them is no longer good enough because they, they already have the information, but what is it they could do with it? I think, you know, there's an opportunity there for them, for us to inform them without influencing sort of um, the ultimate decision-making, right? We could say, basically, these are the different journals that you could reach out. Okay, let me ask the other panelists, please put yourself on mute. We're gonna bring you in in a minute if you have questions that you wanna ask Paul, but I'm getting a note that some people are getting feedback. So if you're not on mute, please mute your microphones and then we'll ask you in a minute or two if you have questions for Paul. And, and the questioner who asked about, uh, what did he ask about? Who disagreed with your statement and asked about journalism as producing content, et cetera, et cetera. He was very happy with your response and thought it was very helpful. We have a question from, uh, um, well, one thing we're getting comments from a lot of our our supporters saying WJFF has spent 30 years building trust with its, uh, with its uh, listener base. And, uh, and uh, particularly in the COVID crisis, we've tried very hard to become a hub of information. Um, so I would think that we're well placed uh, to uh, capitalize on some of these trends you're talking about. And one of our uh, uh, longtime uh, 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 supporters asked, how can we um, learn more about podcasting and uh, would that help uh, and how that might be a potential for, for you know, expanding our programming into new areas? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, my advice is don't do anything if you don't know if people want it. Um, I think you know, a great question is just reach out to your audience. When I say, you know, how many of you are listening to podcasts and what type of podcasts are you listening to, right? You know, for me, you know, my, my advice is always don't duplicate the work that someone else is already doing. Um, really offer something that's truly unique that no one else can do, right? So again, when, when I highlight those, you know, two particular trends, especially, um, you know, folks are hyperly aware about the amenity, right? Like, don't, you know, maybe you don't need to do a podcast about national politics because you already get a lot of that. Like, tell me something about the community that I don't know. You know, again, how do you become that problem solver, right? So I think, you know, a podcast is great, but if people in your area don't generally don't care about podcasts, don't do it, right? They might just care about like, hey, you know what? This is, I, I don't, 
really have like, you know, the latest version of iPhone and I don't want to download this Apple, you know, my phone is mostly Android. Like I might just want like, is there a chat group that I could join, you know, in WhatsApp where like I just get a daily, you know, daily morning briefing from Tim, like that might be as simple as that. Okay, excellent. So localism is a key. Um, let's open this up. Um, I guess I was the sort. I have to be on mute when, when you're talking because I was the source of some of the feedback. So let's, uh, we got another, one more question from the same questioner. And um, let me see if I can find it. Are there any unique trends for local community or rural communities like ours that that you see developing? And after that, we'll we'll ask the panelists if they have questions for you. Um, I would say one thing to really look for is again um, how five G could impact rural community, right? Because I think there's always a lag in rural community about how connected it can be, right? And so in many rural community right now, you know, the, the way COVID impact, like your relationship with distance is also different than a urban or suburban community, right? So I think, you know, think about how that technology get implemented in your area and whether some of these technology will make sense. Again, like podcasts, right? Podcasts is a thing that makes sense for a lot of city folks because, you know, they might be in transportation, they, they can't really, um, you know, they're not in the car, so they're constantly like mobile, right? Like that might be a great thing, but in rural community, like a podcast might or may not work, um, you know, but again, something as simple as a chat group or a text message or an email newsletter might make more sense. Okay, thank you very much. Let's ask our panelists, our local panelists, if they have any questions for you. And let's start with Duncan Cooper. Uh, who's on, I think on a phone, I don't see his video, but Duncan, you had a comment you were expanding on or, or agreeing, I think, with something that Paul said. Did you want to expand on that, uh, that comment that you left in the chat? Uh, no, but I'll just say it out loud because I thought Paul was dead on uh, when he said, don't duplicate what other people are doing. Focus on what's unique about your community. Uh, I think in the context, whether it's podcast, newsletters, newspaper, whatever it is. I think that's like an amazing guiding light for uh, a place like WJFF. Okay, thank you, Dan. Now the other panelists, uh, if you have a comment, could you raise your hand and we'll uh, call on you and then unmute and ask your question. Is that, do any of you have a question you wanna ask Paul? Okay, Lori, go ahead. I was intrigued, hi Paul, I, I loved all your points. Uh, I was intrigued by your comment that this is the new golden age for content creators and that we're not confined by the limitations of like being a radio or a TV phone or, uh, or a computer. Um, how, how do you see that? I, I, look, I publish a local community newspaper um, so I just wondered if there, if, uh, if your foundation is really giving any advice to newspapers in terms of how they kind of balance that, um, you know, with all of those uh, lack of limitations. Yeah, I mean, I think right now, um, you know, again, technology have really lowered the cost of your infrastructure, right? I mean, think about um, in the traditional sense where a newspaper used to not only have the newsroom, you have to have some kind of system that will deliver these like, um, I don't know, these like silver things and then bring it down to the newsroom. And then there's like these printing press and then you have to have the truck drivers. You have like a whole logistic, right? Like just to get the newspaper from one place to another place, right? So, you know, that cost had greatly been reduced because of, you know, technology infrastructure, right? So again, when I think about newspaper, um, you know, to liberate yourself from that form, what is it, what, what is it that you're delivering? Are you primarily a text-based um, journalism organization? Are you primarily text and maybe photo and some video? And again, think about what are the different ways that text and photo appear 
um, to the audience, right? So one big thing that a lot of people are doing now, um, you know, even someone um, legendary like Tom Brokaw, um, you know, are going, you know, they, they basically have their own Substack. So Substack is um, a new platform where you could do your own newsletter. Right, so you have a lot of these well-known journalists are leaving the institution to basically develop themselves as their own brand. So as I think about the evolution of what a, lo a healthy local media ecosystem will look like, it's basically a combination of your established player and a bunch of new players. Um, you know that that is you know experts of something, right? So and the question I have. For you, Laurie, is thinking about how do you become a platform for those new voices, right? So, you know, again, you know, you've been in a community for a while and you, you have that relationship. Um, but who is that, you know, who is that mom who knows everything about the local high school district? And what is her role in your newspaper? And is there a role in, in the newspaper, right? So, so I think, you know, as we think about you know, who we even think about traditional journalists, right? There are, there are skill set that a journalist need to uncover major stories, but there's also sort of like expert that will tell you things that you just need to know, right? Like, you know, what's going on in schools? You know, you know when will my pothole get fixed? Um, you know, why, you know, why is the cell tower not working, right? Those are all you know, all, you know, those are all key questions. And do you need like a, a professional journalist to answer those questions? That could be debatable, right? There will be always somebody who really care about these issues. And I think the question is, what is their role in your organization and how could you be a platform for them? Laura, did you have a follow-up to that or? Uh... Yeah. Okay, yeah, Mike, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Paul, first of all, got uh, some very, very interesting points. I wanted to get back uh, a little bit to the, um, the social media uh, platform and, and some of the things you were talking about. And, you know, as somebody who's, first of all, works in, in a commercial space, I'm the news director for commercial radio stations, Bold Gold Media in New York is essentially three separate music formatted radio stations. But we do a lot of community news. We, uh, I do a podcast myself. And by the way, you know, just to explain how I position my my own radio bold news pod is by uh, having an opportunity to have longer conversations with community members that I might not be able to do because, again, in the commercial space, I'm limited to essentially a three minute newscast in both my morning and afternoon drive. It's a, it's a standard, it's, you know, it, it works. Uh, so there's a lot of cross promotion and cross communication, if you will, between the platforms. There's a podcast and I will usually do a news story that talks about the podcast, drawing listeners there. So it, be go, it goes beyond radio. It's a lot of what you were talking about um, where you don't think of radio anymore. You think of radio, you think of smart speakers, you think of, you know, uh, smart technologies moving into automobiles these days. And that's going to be, I think, even a larger trend over the next few years, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, to, to sort of get to the point, as far as social media goes, and Thane had made reference to this, uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm basically saying is that and we've heard it before in the political sphere is we're basically all in our own echo chamber. A lot of that is on account of algorithms uh, and, and the way these things are set up. So I think there's also, uh, aside from the fact that community journalism is very important, I think there's also an element here where a lot of the general public really needs to sort of educate themselves. And, you know, we talk about it all the time, like going, how does somebody go beyond their comfort zone into, you know, you see a piece of information. I do it because I'm inquisitive and I'm in the journalism business, but you hear somebody say something and you, it might not strike you as being correct. You know, how do you provide the, the other side of the story to people? Yeah, I That's think, um, 
So I, I want to illustrate an example, a great example. There's certain things that are going to, you know, cross um, any ideology sectors, right? And and I'm not here to advocate that um, social media um, is good or bad. However way we feel about social media platform, you know, one thing is for sure is you cannot be a successful media business if you don't know how to manage some of these social media strategy, right? And, and you know, and you need, and again, it needs to be a part of your strategy. It cannot be the complete strategy. Um, you know, something that um, KPCC did out in California, in California Southern Radio, um, you know, during the pandemic, I was talking to the director of audience and just checking in and, and she say, in a span of, you know, a few days, they have a, a very tiny, small audience team for a LA market. So, you know, three people. And they were flooded with 900 plus questions about COVID. They didn't know if they could actually answer all of them. So what I ended up doing is connect them to, them to um, a technologist who I know uh, who worked for a different newsroom and they use artificial intelligence to look at the 900 questions and pass them out into different thematic bucket. The end result was they were able to answer all of the audience question. And more than that, they realized that a lot of the questions that the audience asked were related to how do I file for job unemployment? And then guess what KPCC did? They did a whole webinar showing their audience how you file for unemployment. And this is something that they would never ever imagine doing, right? Because it's not something that you think about as, as a traditional function of the newsroom. So, and when I you know, follow up with the directive audience, she just came up with this great slogan. You know, they say, basically the newsroom and KPCC are asking themselves, how could I be LA's help desk? How could I be LA to help this? I mean, that's a very, it's a subtle change, but it's a radical change, right? Because suddenly they're not looking at themselves in this ivory tower, like I'm here to tell you what you need to know about today's news. They are basically reoriented, saying that in order for us to be useful, we have to help solve problems. And, and you know, and the way for them to solve problem is by giving you the information that you could trust and that you could use, right? Again, I, I really go back to the factor that, you know, trust is earned. And what is it that we're all doing to earn the trust of our local community? Okay, that's, that's great, Paul. That's, uh, that's again, in the context, I think of solution journalism, which is a, is a whole trend. I have a question here from the owner of our local uh, art uh, uh, movie theater, who pre-pandemic at least provides a gathering place for us uh, in person rather than uh, online. She says, our tech devices and social media platforms are designed to create personal re realities which are not healthy. And in fact, turn a profit by actually changing our emotional states and our behaviors. These devices do more harm than good by being, quote, an intermediary or, quote, a content creator. You are essentially taking on the responsibility for deciding what is or is not true and what is or is not important. How do you decide that in this context? I mean, I guess my question is, you know, the technology is not designed one way or the other for good or evil, just like radio could be used for evil, right? Like a lot of dictators have used it for, for bad things. Um, I think it's really about your intent, right? I can't comment on sort of the, the mental health aspect. I, I just think like, you know, I'm on a lot of digital devices, but I also know when I need to stop. And, and you know, I, I, and for some of the folks, I mean, when you think about, managing your digital um, assets, right? Like, just like, I'm not a parent, but if I was a parent, I would make sure that I put in a lot of security protocol to make sure that, you know, what my kids is watching, or I would even, you know, I have older parents and, and you know, in the phone, I basically, basically, you know, in the iPhone, find my iPhone, I basically activated that so that I know where they at. 
right? Because like, it's really easy for them to, so I think technology could work both good and bad. And, and, and you know, again, you know, I can't go into the intent of the content creator, but what I could say is, you know, give your audience a little bit of credit of knowing, you know, when someone is doing something bad, right? That's really about, if they are giving their trust to you, we also have to trust them to have the capacity to make decisions for themselves. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have time maybe for one more question? Is that, do any of our panelists uh, have, uh, have uh, another question? Um, well, I, I might have a question. I mean, Ed, you, you're on the screen. Like, you know, I feel like you're one of the, uh, you know, I don't want to presume you look like you're one of the younger members in this. Like, where yeah. do you consume your news? What is your perspective? Oh, all right. So um, I like to get my news from several different sources instead of just one, like, diehard source that I always follow. I like to follow like multiple different sides of the political spectrum and then I also like to get an outside source like BBC or something it I, I find that that's probably the best way of just getting the roundest idea but, and what is your viewpoint of social media right are you you know I assume you might be on Instagram or yeah. Facebook and TikTok and and you know what what make you trust some of these people on these social media platforms well, I mean, at this point, I think it's trust is coming with time more than with reputation, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and I think that social media is definitely necessary for the advancement of news, even local news. Uh, in the case of my own newspaper, which I'm associate editor of, Manor Inc., uh, we've just started expanding maybe two years ago onto Instagram. And already that's that's boosting us a lot. So I think that it's definitely necessary and I think that it's a great way of expanding horizons and getting to be better known. But you do need to be very wary. You need to know who you're looking at. You need to know what you're consuming, of course. And I mean, that can be very hard to do. But again, like I was saying before with um, trust coming more with time than with reputation, uh, if you see a big name, like a big household news name, regardless of what political side it's on or your own, you immediately go, oh, that's that. Yeah, that's probably trustworthy. Yeah, and I think that's a key insight here, right? So Ed, you went into Instagram because you know how to communicate with folks in Instagram. And, and again, I don't advise anyone to just do Instagram because you feel like no. everyone is doing Instagram. Only do it if you know that's where your audience is, right? And, and do it because you know you could tell your story in a way that's germane and authentic to that particular platform, right? So, you know, again, that, that's, you know, what I'm seeing a lot is a lot of the the media organization is suddenly saying that like, now we have to be, we're all digital, we have to be everywhere. That is not true. Like, mm -hmm. don't be a TikTok news organization if you don't understand TikTok, right? Like, do not go to Instagram if you actually have no photograph or visual story, right? Like, like mm -hmm. people are not gonna look at a bunch of text, right? So you sort of have to think about, you know, how people are consuming sort of like, why did they consume the content in that particular platform and what makes it authentic? And is that in the area of expertise? And, and that's where you really have to, to dig, you know, deeper, right? So again, for, for um, broadcasters, especially audio, think about the power of your voice and where does that manifest? And what kind of digital devices will allow this voice to, to interact with the audience in a way that is authentic to that particular distribution. And, and that's also authentic to you, right? Because if you feel like it's a little bit forced, like you feel like you're doing Instagram because like everyone is, all the cool kids are on it, like you're gonna feel awkward about it. And then the people who are looking at it will know this is awkward. And then suddenly you lose an opportunity, like I'd say, to develop that relationship. 
Okay, Paul, thank you very much. We're gonna to have to end it here. We've, we've gone a little over time, but this has been fascinating. We've gone over time, I think, because it's been a fascinating discussion. So thank you very much for, for doing this, Paul. And, um, and we hope to be back in touch for another session if we can at some point, because I think this has been very enlightening. So thank you very much. And, if and thank we, you for having me. And if we could give you a round of applause, please do. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna we're gonna cut out of this and go to our uh, local. ED. If you want to stay, you can listen in on our local uh, um, um, panel discussion if you like, Paul. We're gonna have a discussion of these panelists on local issues, and you already started off because uh, Ed was my first uh, my first panelist, so you've given it a start. So um, you want to stay stay around and listen, or are you gonna, oh, he's gonna go? Okay. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to do a panel. I'm listening. I'm just turning my radio. I'm just turning my video off. <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to go to a uh, um, local panel discussion now. And I'm going to introduce the speakers very briefly. And then uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk to them each in succession. Our first speaker and youngest panelist is Ed Lundquist, who you just heard from. He's a 10th grader living in Livingston Manor with his parents. He's associate editor, as he mentioned, of Manor Inc., which is a youth newspaper in the Catskills. And he's a contributor to our radio station. And we're gonna, st st he's gonna be our first panelist because he represents to me the future. And then we'll go to Lori Stewart, who's our stalwart, who's maintaining our uh, weekly newspaper with great courage and perseverance. She grew up in New Jersey and, and says she fell into newspapering by serendipity. In addition to being a newspaper woman, she is a Unitarian Universalist minister and sees parallels between those two roles. So we'll try and tease out a little bit of that and when we talk to her. Third will be Mike, you've, you've heard uh, a little bit of Mike Sokal. He's the news director of Bold uh, Gold Media, a local uh, uh, radio uh, group. Um, he was born in Astoria, Queens, and spent much of his youth in, in uh, Athens, Greece. He returned to, to the United States at 17 and has been living in our area um, for 40 years, much of that time as a news uh, director and newsman. Uh, he's also going to expect, I think, express some of the views of uh, Vince Benedetto, who's the CEO of this group, and uh, who had uh, planned to take part in this panel, but got called away on a, a business uh, trip. And Vince is fascinating because he thinks radio is a growth industry. And he's been uh, building up his uh, radio group for some time now. Fourth will be Jason Dole, who's down in the, or who just came away from his on-air duties. He's down on my screen, he's down in the, in the bottom of the screen. He's done a stellar job uh, as our program director. He spent his career in radio and uh, he's been instrumental along with uh, Tim Bruno in, in expanding our, uh, our uh, public affairs coverage since the COVID uh, crisis hit. He was recently named best radio personality in the River Reporters 25th Annual Reader's Choice Awards. Yay, Jason. And um, then our last panelist, and but not least, we've also heard a little bit from is Duncan Cooper. Uh, Duncan is a member of WJFF's board. He makes his living as a di digital strategy consultant with, I think with a lot of big companies as well as uh, Google and whatnot and other numerous companies. Before moving to our area, he was editor in chief of the Fader, which is a, from what I gather, and I'm not hip and I'm not young, so I don't really know, but a very hip music and lifestyle uh, publication. So that's Duncan. He's hip and young, uh, at least by comparison with me. So let's start off with our first uh, uh, panelist, Ed Lundquist. Uh, we heard a little bit. I wanted you to talk a little bit about your, um, your own consumption of news, which you've already sort of done. Do you have anything you want to add on that? Where do you, you, you also get your news from, you say you, you go to the left and the right and try and find the middle. You also get yeah. news from Google. Do you read news at all? I do, I do. Um, I don't read news as much as I say watch and listen to news. Uh, but often if my dad finds something because he's probably the most 
common news reader in the family. If he finds something particularly interesting, he'll show me and I'll take a look. Uh, for the most part, where I get my consumption is from radio, podcasts, and I mean, social media, like I said, like YouTube. Um, and I, I just sort of get shortened TV versions, but uh, it, it's pretty general for me. I'm getting pretty much all different ways. All right, you said when we talked on the phone that your friends tend to be pol politically divided along the lines of their parents, um, their parents' uh, uh, political uh, persuasion. So if their parents are conservative, they tend to be conservative. If their parents are liberal, they tend to be liberal. Talk a little bit about that, that divide that you see even among the youth uh, in our area. Uh, well, we don't really talk about it that much. Um, for the most part, the divide is kind of unspoken, but it is there. Um, e even ju just in like cliques in school, I suppose you would call them. Uh, it's pretty clear who's where based on who hangs out with who. That just uh, simple stuff like that. I think that it's a very strong boundary, although we're pretty good about it. Um, I think that in other cases, it can be very strong. I'm sorry, I'm not really sure where I'm going with this. I'm a little bit off. You're doing great. Um, you're doing great, but uh, you're talking about a divide and you, a, a political divide, and you say you don't talk much about it. How can we, how can we bridge that divide if we don't, uh, if we're, we're sort of afraid to talk to one another, even um, as young people? Um, again, I'm the kind of person who thinks of things coming with time and effort well, like alongside they go hand in hand so i think that that sort of block between us will go away eventually i think it may be a while and i don't think that it's going to happen overnight of course but i think that there will be a, a point when it is no longer there or is extremely lessened Right now, we're very civilized about it. Like I said, we don't talk about it. We try to avoid it. And that's what keeps us pretty good. Um, if we do start to talk about it, it gets pretty clear that some people get very uncomfortable. And again, that's kind of what separates us. Okay. And you're an associate editor, I think, of Manor Inc., which is a print publication. Yeah. You're Consuming a lot of news online, but you're, you've gone into print at least for this period of your, your high school education or your youth education. What is the appeal of Manor Inc? And do your, are your friends interested in it? Uh, well, most of my friends that are interested are actually a part of it right now, which is really great. I have two of them here in the chat with me. Um, so the appeal. The appeal of Manor Inc. is that it is local. It's not local in the sense that it gives you both local and general, um, like government, I suppose you'd say, news. It is almost entirely local. And that's a sort of quirk about it that I think keeps it alive and keeps it thriving. Is but not only that it's local, but also that it's completely youth run. The only help that we have from adults are just the mentors who just guide us and guide some of the younger kids who are just now joining. Um, the other appeal from the point of people who are writing in it is definitely that it's a great stepping stone. It's a really good start, especially if you want to get into something like news or even just writing about anything or podcasting or radio. It's, a, it's an excellent branching device. And once you get into it, you find that you really enjoy it and it just spreads out like a tree's branches and you have all these different pathways which you can go. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. Ed. Let's move on to- uh, Thank you. Laura, but stay with us. And if you have questions, we'll get to a Q&A. Laurie uh, Stewart, uh, as I said, you're a hero uh, in our area because you're keeping alive a local newspaper. There's a uh, something called the usnewsdesert.com, which is published by the uh, the uh, University of um, North Carolina Journalism School, and it and they do an annual report, 
and they have a map that you can click on. And when you click on our area, we would be a new, Sullivan County has one, according to their map, one newspaper and we would be a, a news desert without you. So <laughs> we should be appreciative of you uh, for holding up the banner. But how, you've talked when I talked to you on the phone a little bit about the new model for uh, the emerging model for newspapers. We've lost like uh, 2,000 weekly newspapers in the United States since, since 2004. 2,100 newspapers have died. 2,000 of them have been weekly and non-daily newspapers. And yet you're keeping your newspaper alive and you have hopes of, you said you, when I talked to you, you were optimistic. How, how, how you, what is the emerging model for keeping a paper like the River Reporter alive? Well, I think uh, Paul touched on it uh, in terms of solution based journalism uh, and Ed saying that, you know, people cannot talk to each other because we're we're in we're in our each silos. However, there is this path that if you are a trustworthy news uh, media that there that that there is possibility that you could actually be helping people uh, have civic and civil dialogue about things that they care about. And the River Reporter really tries to position itself there. We definitely have our reputation of being about the arts, about being about the environment, but we also have a reputation of really wanting to hear all of the sides and to reflect back. Right now we're doing something called a, a a monthly conversation experiment. And we're throwing out prompts to people and we're asking them to, to, um, to give us uh, an answer to the prompt. This month's prompt was about, if you were gonna turn down the heat just a little bit, what would you do? And, and the, you know, and we printed, we throw it out in the beginning of the month and we print, we print the responses at the end of the month, but they were varied. And one of the, one of the responses was totally like, I would tell the news media to not print every, anything if there's unnamed sources. So I, I think that, I think the a community newspaper that holds trust, that really tries to present um, different, all the different viewpoints has the opportunity to really get into that solution-based journalism. And that's the place where the River Reporter has really tried in its 43 years of, or 44 years of existence to, uh, to, to, to um, maintain. And, what, and you and I talked a little bit about the, the other thing that is going on, Knight Ritter is like putting forth these training, uh, these training sessions where uh, people can can uh, news news people news organizations can can learn technology. Uh, Google also has a, uh, a Google News uh, initiative, and they and what they're saying, interestingly enough, is that Google, in terms of their in terms of their mission, their mission is to educate people. Well, newspapers' mission. A community newspapers mission is also to educate people. So what they're saying is that there's this real overlap. And so that gives newspapers. So the newspaper industry, which is in this flux, mainly because of the <laughs> because of the the internet and, and and these like you know big boy players and and the news media, they have an overlapping mission. And that overlapping mission is inspiring and it's inspiring to give people information and education so that they can make better decisions in their lives. So it kind of feeds into that, uh, you know, that, that uh, solution-based journalism, it feeds into like community and civic uh, journalism and holding space for diverse people to talk to each other. The radio, you know, if you, you know, if you're just, you know, in your car or whatever, that's very equitable. It comes in over the airwaves. Uh, newspapers are very equitable too, in terms of for $1.50 a week, you have the same information that your neighbor has. Um, so it's, it's it, I'm very bullish about it because it's so imperative. It's imperative that we be uh, uh, building this trust in our community. It's imperative that we be holding up space so that people really understand what their community is. 
especially at this time of pandemic where the world is getting smaller, but the world is also changing really rapidly. Our area is going through an amazing Democrat, Democrat, uh, demographic shift. People need to know they're coming into a place that has a history, that has a sense of place, that has those small businesses. And I, I totally identified with the points that, that Paul was making. And those two things, you know, it's really a both and. And I think that local journalism has this, it, it, it's not the only avenue for the advertiser to get their marketing message out, but it is such an essential message about local. And, and that just makes me, and, and that's not gonna go away. That's what's in our hearts. I mean, in one sense, that's why I do what I do is to help and to hold space for people to actually like kind of speak from their hearts and not necessarily their rhetoric. I did also want to just touch on the idea of this con concept uh, con contextualization of the news. When we have a little more time, you know, it's not social media where you just like kind of flash off something, you know, that you haven't thought about. The whole idea of writing things down really helps people, um, helps people uh, gather their thoughts and, and hopefully get to a reflective uh, place where they're not speaking from you know, their haste, but they're speaking from their reflections. And I think newspapers have the capability of doing that. Thoughtful radio has the, has the capability to do that. And I think that our audiences really do realize that this is a solution. The process of communication and how we do it and how it's structured and how it's facilitated is huge and people know it. I think they know it. Okay, and some uh, which have talked about going not for profit. Is that something you've uh, considered? Oh, I've considered a lot of stuff. I, I wanted to be a cooperative for a while, but the, the newspaper actually is, um, you know, my accountant always said, Laura, you can't give people things that are a liability to them. Um, <laughs> okay. so, so anyway, so, you know, nonprofit uh, is definitely a way. Um, newspapers are really moving much more toward membership and membership tiers. And that is something that the River Reporter is actively looking into right now. Yeah, how do you give people the experience? How do you, you know, kind of like the, what the radio does. Okay, let's move on then. Uh, let's move on to Mike, uh, who is the news director for Bold Gold. Uh, and one of the things that uh, astonished me when I was talking to your CEO is that he thinks uh, radio is a growth business. He started out as an entrepreneur with four stations uh, and when he was in his late 20s and now I think you're up to 14. Right. Everybody, yeah. everybody else thinks radio is dying. Uh, he thinks it's a growth business and you've hitched your uh, career to it. So, so what's the deal there? Well, uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I hey, Vince Benedetto, who is our CEO, is, is very much a cheerleader of the, uh, the radio business. Um, you know, he, he, he says it so well. But I think one of the main points, uh, one of the basic points about radio, and this is true statistically, is in terms of number of people that listen to what's referred to these days as terrestrial radio, meaning, you know, your over the air radio, uh, that that aggregate number of people has remained the same for for several years now, uh, over several decades, in fact. And even today, when we have micro broadcasting uh, or, or uh, over off the air online satellite radio and and other forms of entertainment and communications, um, free radio and over the air radio is still. Uh, very much a, a large part of the community uh, in terms of, uh, and, and the other thing is, and I think Paul touched upon this earlier, talking about the various platforms, you know, it really comes down to how you're defining radio. And these days, you know, if you're, if you're in the radio business, the radio business is a number of things. It's on air. It's, uh, it's also, it's online. You engage with your on social media, you're doing it on so many different platforms, maybe not exactly the same thing, but you're, you're 
cross connecting and, and cross communicating with various segments of your audience. And it's a large audience. And, the, and as far as our approach, and the one thing that I very much appreciate about Bold Gold Media and when you know I had first met Vince and, and because for many years and people that might know my, my career here, I had been working at WVOS as a, as a standalone radio station going back to uh, late 1980. And uh, and I think Thane, you made you made reference to me being news director over the years. I've I've actually taken on the full time news director job here only for the past of about five years now. I, I'd been functioning in the news uh, business prior to that, and and had had done news at, at several different times. But um, point being, I started out with with uh, WVOS and. And moved on to Bold Gold Media when I first met Vince. Uh, he, the main, the main thing that Vince said to me, and the thing that convinced me and made me feel comfortable coming over here or staying in Sullivan County and, and working with Thunder 102 at the time, is that his whole emphasis was on communities. You know, it was it was local radio. It's the local personalities, and in fact, even our corporate structure, all all three of our our groups uh, are independent. There's a Bold Gold New York office. There's a Bold Gold office in the in the Homesdale area, uh, covering Wayne Pike County, Pennsylvania mostly, and, and surrounding area. And there's also a Scranton Wilkesbury office. And those offices actually program and operate independent of each other, so that we're 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 down to, you know, we really operate at the grassroots community level. So, and I think that's, uh, it's, it's become more common and it's becoming a more common thing. And I think with, with everything these days, you know, there's the national scene, but there's also the importance. And I think it's even it taken on more importance to communicate with your local audience. And whether that's through social media or podcasting or over the air, and many times, you know, the, the importance of even with our music broadcasting, which is, is the majority of our programming is entertainment, it's music, but it's also those personalities in the morning that everybody is used to and, and the local news that's incorporated in there and the various features and even the contests that just bring people some fun during a horrible time like COVID. Uh, you know, those are all things that, that, that are important. And I think they're important to all of us in, in terms of, of local media at, uh, at every level, whether it's, you know, what Lori's doing, what Jason is doing. It's, it's, it's all part of our community and our focus. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you, thank you, Mike. That, those are good points. Let's move on to our other radio guy, uh, Jason Dole, who uh, Mike just made reference to. Jason, you've uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, Mike, you've devoted your career to radio, and I uh, kind of wonder what what are you crazy? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you've been instrumental in uh, in moving WJFF in the last year to much more much more public affairs programming. <laughs> why why do you think that's important, and 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 what has been the effect? Ah, oh, boy, can can you guys hear me first? Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Because I'm not. I'm not used to not being able to hear myself in the headphones. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, I mean. I mean. What we did, like, like connecting the community. I mean, that's crucial. I mean, that's what. That's what we're here for. Uh, picking up on a keyword that Lori touched on, uh, educational. Like, like the foundational need for information. Um, whether you're talking about our civic lives. Uh, and civic duty, or you're just talking about people getting through their day to day lives. You know, people need that information. And uh, I've been here long enough that I remember we used to sign off at night and we have to read something that said we were shutting off the transmitter. And part of that was saying uh, WJFF Radio Catskill is a non-commercial educational broadcaster. Um, so as I did the work here as a volunteer, uh, part-time working with youth radio, uh, and then on as program director, you know, the educational sticks with me now of course we have a lot of stuff that's that's entertaining more so than it's educational but we're always looking for that educational uh angle 
in whatever we do, even if it's, you know, again, music uh, programming. Um, I'm sorry, Thane, what, was there anything else to that question? Oh, that's a good answer. Do you, do you sense, uh, you've been at this for quite a while as, as Mike, do you sense a, a growth in partisanship when you, uh, when you uh, um, among the people you talk to and among the, uh, you know, the audience base. I mean, is it uh, is that sensible to you, the, the increase in partisanship? Well, yeah, but like, I don't need to be in radio for that. I mean, I, I you know, I'd get that if, if when you leave the house in America in 2020, now 2021, but uh, I, I'd get that even if I didn't leave the house, uh, which a lot of us didn't in 2020. But, uh, you know, that's that's definitely... That's definitely part of that. I mean, I don't, I don't want to go too far in that. But again, the the, to me, there's, there's people who talk about the 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 social psychological component of how do two sides come together, and our side that's much more the informational and the conversational. And again, to go back to that that foundation, like if you want to have a functioning democracy that at least at times is able to overcome such high partisan barriers. Um, you need to, you know, if you want to find common ground between two diametrically opposed sides, um, that common ground will be based in fact. It will, the facts are what we need to stand on in order to have um, a, a healthy and functioning uh, republic, democratic representative republic. So, so that's crucial. And unfortunately, I do feel like we've seen um, very much an erosion of the importance of facts among a large segment of the population and everybody can point the finger in a lot of different places and people point at social media and things like that but uh i mean that's that's something to really watch out for um i don't know there's a few other things i wanted to mention and some of it's just tying in the the moment that uh again uh, i actually worked for bold gold media for a few years and it was the first time i ever worked for a com uh, uh, commercial radio I had done commercial newspaper uh, before. So I've got connections to a lot of the folks here and I've got connections to the, the different mediums of working in newspaper, also working in radio. Um, but you know, right now on air, we've got our, our local veterans talk show, Let's Talk Vets with our own Doug Sandberg. And he was, he was uh, uh, you know, referencing to me, we spoke before we went on air and he was talking about Vince and the, the whole approach of people asking Vince like, how do you have, because what's unique about what Bold Gold has done is creating a small private network in the post clear channel era. And for people that don't know, but you go back to uh, deregulations that happened in the nineties, all of a sudden um, bigger and bigger companies could buy more and more media outlets. And that was the trend of the industry to the point where you've got, uh, you know, clear channel and cumulus owning most of the stations uh, coast to coast. And here's somebody with a private network uh, that he's built up, meaning a small independent network, not part of uh, Cumulus or Clear Channel or any of those big nationals. Um, and that's, that's pretty impressive. So Doug was talking to me off air, off webinar, saying, well, you know, he, he respects that if you, when he asked Vince, how do you compete with them? How do you compete with, you know, uh, this major national radio outlet or this major national radio app or something? And he says, we don't. We don't. We do what we do in each community. We serve each community, and that's a. And he's a sharp business guy. That keeps you competitive, uh, whether you're in a, the business of business or, if, like us, we're just in the business of the information and the community itself. And I go there because, like, and I don't know to what extent this helps tonight's conversation, but since there is an audience and it's this uh, concept that I've shared with people before, I used to share it with the youth radio students we had. I'll share it with folks tonight. It, to me, it's a rhetorical question that I would ask too, which is what's the point of radio um, at all in the era where now people are walking around with supercomputers in their pocket that can play any movie, can play any TV show. Like all the devices you would have bought in the 80s that would have filled a room so you could play all your media, you've got it in your, your cell phone when you're walking around. So what's the point of radio? And what I would tell the kids and when I tell new volunteers again, sometimes now is that the, 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 the point of it is that it takes us back to the very roots of what makes us human. At some point, we went from being um, these hominids that didn't know how to make fire to being able to make fire and to cook meat and get our protein much more efficiently. And what did people do when they sat around the fire and they developed 
the big brains that we enjoy today, they talk. Or sit in the dark, you look at that fire and you, you, you talk and you communicate and you share the stories of who you are and who you've been and where you've come from and where you might go in the future, which is the thing that makes us unique as creatures. We have that planning, that ability to imagine. And that is what I tell people, that's what radio is. Radio is that, that spark that we sit around. Radio is that voice in the dark, just one person reaching out to another and sharing ideas. And Lord knows we've had our share of darkness in the last year. And that's why it's been great to be somewhere where we can, you know, gather people around the warmth of the electric glow of the radio and, and uh, that's, that's, share some of those stories. That's why we need some a good dose of uh, idealism and, and uh, optimism. Thank you, Jason. That's excellent. Let's move on to uh, Duncan Cooper. We need to, Duncan, as I said, uh, is at least compared to me, young and hip, and he, and he uh, was the editor in chief of the Fader, which tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll go into the digital future from your point of view, for digital future for radio. But first of all, tell sure. us a little bit about the Fader and, and what that was like. Yeah, The Fader is an independently owned music magazine. It's been around for about uh, 25 years at this point. I worked there for about 10. Um, my role as editor in chief involved a 24 seven news website, um, bi monthly print magazine that went out internationally, video team, podcasts, uh, social media. So really the whole broad range of of media I was involved in there. Um, and it was really exciting. And I hope in my small way to bring anything I ever learned there um, to help the station. Okay, tell us a, tell us a little bit about um, uh, social media and how that can fit into WJFF's future. Uh, you've been a big proponent, you're a board member, you've been a big proponent of that. People are often saying negative things about social media, you know, the, the, the misinformation and the, and the opinion, opinion, opinionated nature of it. What is the positive uh, role that that can play in the future of uh, local news and uh, radio in particular? Well, I think it just comes down to meeting your audience um, where they are and you know, if that's where your audience is spending more time of their day, it's important to have a presence there. I think that for WJFF, particularly as a news organization, it's really essential to be distributing those stories efficiently on as many platforms um, that your audience likes to be on as possible. And to do that in the most effective ways on that platform as well, not just spamming links at every opportunity, but really you like understanding. I think this was something Paul talked about um, and I agree with, um, which was that, and I can use it to sort of like dial back what I said a little, um, you know, don't just be on Instagram to be on Instagram, be on Instagram efficiently and understand why you're there. It is a visual medium. Is there a way that radio makes sense as a visual medium? Well, there's a lot of ways it can, but I think the smart thing is like really considering what those are. The same thing with uh, Facebook or whatever it is. I think it's like understanding and speaking on those things in their terms, because the reality is like, that's where people are. Okay. All right. Uh, any other further comments, Duncan? Uh, um, you're a big, uh, uh, you talk a lot about uh, about podcasts in particular. Is that something that we should really be doing a lot more of at WJFF? We're just getting started. Yeah, I think for, to me, podcasting, it, everything I just said applies maybe double there when you start looking at the long term. Um, the reality is like younger people increasingly are engaging with the internet on their phones not in their cars. I think COVID was a massive move from people listening to audio on the internet instead of in their cars. And I think that is going to continue. Um, and the fact of the matter is like people who engage in podcasts traditionally listen more to podcasts than they do to traditional uh, terrestrial radio. There's a recent study by Westwood One, they said it was 40% more time that people will spend with a podcast than they would terrestrial radio. Um, 
And I think that's a major opportunity for, yeah. And the other thing that I would say about podcasting is like, you know, as a technology, it, it added a lot of like really good features to audio. I think what Jason said like is kind of nice that we're ultimately getting, you know, this is ultimately talk, but the reality is like radio doesn't have a monopoly on talk, you know, so does Zoom, so do new apps that are even beyond podcasting like Clubhouse and the live audio space. So I think, um, it's really important to stay abreast of those so that they don't completely eclipse you. And when we look at newspapers, uh, you know, what has happened on the internet, they have to exist there. Maybe, let me rephrase that. Uh, the ones that make the most money and have the longest term like healthy growth strategies exist in many ways on the internet. And I think um, it's important for a radio station to do that you know, as well. Okay, thank you, Duncan. Now, Paul Chung, are you still with us? Uh, yes. You've been listening in. Did you yeah. have? Did you, you? One of the things you said when we spoke on the phone was that uh, that radio isn't important. What is important is, is so much as a, it, it's a it's just a a device for for voice, and that ties in with what uh, Duncan was just talking about. Anyway, do you have any um, any uh, any last questions or summary comments before we, we end this discussion since you've stuck with us? Uh, yeah, I think you have a great group of expert, experts already in the community, right? And I think, um, I would say like part of being a good local journalist is actually just talk to people. Um, I think now is a great time to just not make any assumption and really just talk to people in our community. Like, what is it that you want? Like, is the format we're delivering to you still relevant? And if not, how could we do a better job? And, you know, without getting into the politics of things, I, I feel like, you know, a lot of times there's one point in our country that we, we there's no dispute of what we think the problem is. There's always different viewpoint and how we come up with the solution to tackle the problem, right? So I think now is the time for us to, to go back and really talk to the community. It's like, what is the problem that we all face? Never mind sort of what the solutions are, right? There's many different viewpoints, but we have to be able to, to have some kind of agreement. And then based on that, you know, then we could have you know, we as journalists is facilitating the conversation and the dialogue and offer basically our, you know, do our reporting. Here's what people are thinking. Here's what people are saying, right? And instead of getting into this sort of like endless shouting match. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Paul. And thanks for sticking with us. I'm going to pass the mic to uh, Jim Lomax. I want to thank all our panelists before I do. You've done a great job, very interesting uh, conversation we've had here. And Jim is going to give our, uh, some final remarks and we'll end the program with his, uh, his presentation. Go ahead, Jim. Thanks, Thane. Um, my name is Jim Lomax. I'm a past president of, of the WGFF Board of Trustees and currently the, uh, a co-chair of the capital campaign for our Liberty uh, Station project. I wanted to thank uh, Judith Schwarzstein and, and Thane Peterson for organizing this program and certainly for Thane for moderating the program tonight. And also I wanna thank our keynote speaker and our members of the panel. Uh, WJFF Radio is a re remarkably uh, resi resilient organization that has a proud 30 year history of producing quality 24 seven broadcasting for this community. Over, over these years, there have been many success stories and award-winning programs produced by volunteers and staff, along with challenges faced by most nonprofit organizations and especially smaller independent stations like WJFF. The, the biggest challenge in our history, however, has been the last year during the COVID pandemic. COVID certainly has taken its toll on all of us, but our station has soldiered on and continuing to produce 24-7 content, new programs, 
and keeping the listeners informed of the status of this dangerous pandemic during this past year. We're not out of the woods, but certainly having knowledge will keep us safer. Uh, we again have to thank Tim Bruno and Jason Dole for their very hard work and dedication over this past year. It has really been phenomenal. Uh, several years ago, we were given a wonderful gift of land and a commercial building outside of Liberty by Barbara Martinsons. We talked in the years before this time about the need for more space, improving our connectivity to uh, our listeners and upgrading our technology. This gift was certainly perfectly timed for us. During the past two years, we have, been, we have completed the plans for the new station house. All of us, staff, board, our wonderful volunteers are looking forward to moving into a state-of-the-art radio station in Liberty. This new home will take us into the next 30 years of our existence. This new facility will be larger with, com with common space for multiple use. The studio will be wired with state-of-the-art digital equipment. We will increase our youth involvement because of our proximity to Liberty and Monticello along with working with the BOCES students across the street. We, we continue to pledge uh, to be green and kind to our environment by using solar panels and energy efficient heating, cooling, lighting systems. You're going to be hearing a great deal of this uh, about our, this project in the weeks and months ahead, along with ways for everyone to contribute to this project. We certainly could not do any of this without your, the listeners' support. We are all stakeholders, stakeholders in growing the outreach of WGFF in this community. We need to continue to be sound supporters by financial contributions, volunteering, and participating in our community outreach activities. Again, I wanna thank everyone uh, for being here with us tonight. Certainly keep safe and certainly keep masks. So good night, good evening. Thanks everybody for attending. Uh, that's the end of the webinar today. Thanks to all the panelists. Um, we'll make a recording available on our website. Oops. We'll make a recording available on our website and I'll send a note out when that is up and available. Um, have a great night and stay safe. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Paul. Hey, everybody. Yeah, and... <laughs>